We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. So for context for these weekly lives, um, what I like to do is I, I, I give out a, um, a weekly newsletter and some of you have obviously come into this group as a result of um, clicking the link in that newsletter. Thank you for that. Others, if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, the MindMate newsletter, you're more than welcome to. Um, I try to give out um, pieces of value, you know, for things I'm interested. I, I do a lot of writing because I'm interested in writing and dream interpretation and so forth. But my fundamental goal, I think, with therapy um, in a nutshell is to help people simplify and create fulfilling lives. And we kind of break that down. So what do we need to, you know, simplify our lives and 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 ensure that they are fulfilling? Well, we need a degree of self-awareness. And then how do you get self-awareness? Well, you start to learn more about yourself. You spend time alone. And, you know, as you go further and further and further down, you break those big goals down. This is even just a, a you know, a piece of value for you now. Um, you start to see where the next step is and, you know, meaning and purpose and fulfilling these are fulfillment. These are all big, big words, but when we break them down, we actually start to, I mean, it's, it's almost like the tangible next step manifests itself in front of us. And that's my big motivation as a counselor is how can I get people moving through a framework from point A to point B. We need to know the point B, but sometimes we're so, so, so far away from that that we actually just need to know how to put our left foot in front of our right foot. So I hope that, um, you know, these, these weekly lives give you some value and I'm looking forward to growing them with you. So I've got some newsletter questions here today that I wanted to bring up. But as I said um, in, the, in the post um, earlier today, my time, um, we're going to be hitting finding why finding your purpose is a lot like drinking red wine. And for some of you who've worked with me, um, one-on-one, -on -one, you will, uh, you'll probably recognize this analogy, but I think it's a really pertinent, uh, analogy because I think analogies help us kind of understand seemingly esoteric ideas, um, because they kind of apply to what we do every day. So there's that one There's why anxiety decreases with increased certainty. That's a really important one. And then uh, the final one is newsletter questions answered. But this is kind of how I'm going to roll with, with these lives and we'll just see where they take us. I suppose I'll try to hit them up once a week unless anything changes, which I doubt. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how they go. Okay. Also too, this is an open group. If you know anyone out there who you think might benefit from the discussions that we all have together, invite them in the group, let me know about them. Um, I'm pretty sure you can invite people and, um, and we'll just, we'll see where it takes us. Okay. So without further ado, we're eight minutes in already. Okay. Let's hit the first one. Why finding your purpose is a lot like drinking red wine. Okay. So the first thing that I want to talk about here is what finding your purpose actually means. Okay. Finding your purpose is a very dumb sentence and it's a very effective marketing strategy that, you know, even if I'm being honest, I've, I've, um, you know, used, um, because so many of us are interested in this concept of finding your purpose. Um, and what I try to do thereafter is if I have had someone opt in as a result of that, I quickly break it all down and go, Hey, by the way, you won't ever find it. it doesn't exist. Okay. But what does exist is a you are you as you learn more about yourself. This is a lot like finding your favorite red wine. You've got 400 bottles of red wine in front of you when you start day one. That's when we're born, okay? And as a process of learning more about ourselves, following our interests, our likes, and our dislikes, we eventually come to see the 100 bottles of red wine that we much prefer over the other 300. This is what a purpose is all about, finding a sense of enjoyment from what we do in our lives. And if you keep following your bliss, as Joseph Campbell wrote, The Power of Myth would say, um, what you eventually see is that the 100 bottles of red wine become 50 and they become 25. And then what I've noticed is I've followed this myself 
is that your life tends to become a consistent flow state. And what's wonderful about a flow state is that you don't know when you're in it. You know, it's just this beautiful, heavenly kind of biblical religious experience. And it's only when you come out of that, when you have to run an errand or, you know, take on some responsibilities that you go, oh, geez, I was in that place. That's amazing. And I think it's so important for us to chase, chase those states. You know, what do you enjoy doing just because you enjoy doing it? You know, and for a lot of people, that's creativity, but not for everyone. You know, Warren Buffett, <laughs> he enjoyed making money, you know, and that was, that's amazing. And he did bloody well at it, you know, so it doesn't really matter what it is too much more. So it's how can you chase that sensation of flow, but back to this finding your purpose. So the other thing to think about finding your purpose is that again, like I said, you won't ever find it. But what that means is you'll find a more purposeful purpose, the more you keep penetrating it. So your purpose is like a series of concentric circles. That's the way David Data describes it in, um, in, in one of his books. And we keep following it, you know? So for 10, 10 years ago, it, um, you know, mine was um, wanting to make the AFL, which for everyone out, outside of Australia is Australia's equivalent of perhaps the Premier League, um, you know, in the UK or the NFL in America. I know there's some American people in here. Um, so I wanted to play, you know, the sport at the top level. And that was my purpose because I was on a mission to get to the summit of Mount Everest, which was making it into the AFL. Now my mission has changed. And to be totally honest with you, it's to become a best-selling author. But obviously I love my, my day job and stuff of that nature as well. But the purpose ensues as a result of you being motivated to chase a major dream. So the purpose is actually the next step, the next step, okay? So when you're on that path, that's where the meaning is. So you think about that back to the analogy of the red wine, okay? In the beginning, which is where I see a lot of people, day one, okay, existential therapy in a nutshell. How do I find my purpose? I've got all these ideas. I don't know what to do. I'm depressed. I'm anxious as a result. And I'm not trying to, you know, um, be patronizing or, you know, say that tongue in cheek because it really does lead to low mood. Um, and, and, and that's not good. And that's why I find fulfillment in my job. But at the very beginning of a, of a, of a mountain, the, the bottom of a mountain, there's so many different roads that could potentially get you to the peak. And it's, it's overwhelming because you don't know which one to take. There's only a finite amount of time, you'll die, so forth. So you start with one and it doesn't feel right. And then you keep going. And maybe that's the one that gets you to the peak, but probably not. And then half, you know, halfway down, halfway up, sorry, you have to get off it. And it feels shit because you feel like you're going back to square one, but you're not. And I try to make this point every time I'm with a client in clinical practice. You're not at day one because now you know that that wasn't the right path. So there are only 399 bottles of red wine in front of you. That's a win. You've learnt. You're not at day one. Now, the flow state and the sense of purpose comes about after 50 attempts of trying to get to the top or trying to figure out which bottle of red is your favorite red. So after 50, you've kind of got an idea now that you're not really into Shiraz. So you've just knocked out like a shit ton of red wine there, or you've really been able to see, okay, hang on a second here. Um, there's like a heap of parts that I thought could get to Mount Everest, but actually don't. So I, I kind of, I'm on something here. I'm onto something. That's that sense of purpose. But that purpose, so passion starts it because you're like, I want to get to the top of Mount Everest. I really want to find my favorite red wine, something like that. Discipline and waking up every day and showing up and trying different paths and trying different red wines gets you to the place where you start to feel that sense of purpose. Okay. So guys, in the comments, what I want to um, ask you is just, if you just think of an idea, um, do you, you just say yes or no. Do you feel like you have a better idea to use the analogy of um, red wines you like? Okay. So just say yes or no. I just want to get an idea of where you guys are at with this. Um, also, let me know if this is all making sense or if these analogies are too ridiculous. <laughs> so that's that idea. Okay. Around purpose here. Okay. It's building towards something using discipline by showing up because that spark of passion was enough for you to just go for it. You know, you get one life on a whim. Okay. So that's that idea about, um, how finding a purpose can be a lot like drinking red wine. Okay. As I said, let me know in the comments. Um, if, again, if you're watching this on replay, 
um, respond, hashtag replay, and then say either yes or no, whether that's, um, that's kind of making sense to you, okay? The next one here is why anxiety decreases as a result of increasing certainty, all right? So anxiety is, in a nutshell, uncertainty. What anxiety does, it's an incredibly effective emotion because an emotion is, you know, it's kind of different to a feeling. An emotion is something that influences us to do something, okay? There's motivational cues there, okay? It's an energy in motion. Now, when you're feeling anxious, people feel it all differently. Sometimes it's in the gut. For me, it's in the belly. A lot of people have it in their hands or whatever it is. Um, when you start to feel it, that feeling goes up into the head and you get all these thoughts. And what all these what-if thoughts are doing, they are basically trying to simulate um, projections of worst case future scenarios to keep you alive. What if it's a tiger? What if it's a ghost? What if it's a bat? What if, what if, what if? I'm sure you've had a what-if thought before. All right. When we are feeling certain about something, about our lives, there's less anxiety simply because there's, the, the, there isn't a need for the anxiety to project that many what if thoughts because you've narrowed your focus. So if I'm completely overwhelmed about who I am, what I want to do, you know, straight out of high school as an example, before uni, you know, we've, we've all been through this, or it's like in the beginning of a, um, you log on to Netflix and then you go, what movie are you going to watch? You know, it's like an anxiety invoking um, experience, especially after high school, because you kind of like, what the hell do I want to do? Because there's so many options, your mind goes, what if this, 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 that makes you feel more anxious. So part of the result of following your purpose, and you can see how this kind of plays into the first um, answer here, is that if you take it out, 50 bottles of red wine, or if you've tried 50 different paths up to the top of Mount Everest, there's literally just less things for your anxiety to um, think about, project. There's less what if thoughts because you know that they're not for you. Put that in the bag over there, done. As you get older and older and older in life, become more certain about who you are and what you want to do and how who you are can be played out in an effective way in our society, less anxiety ensues because you're just, there's no need for those what if thoughts to be there, you know? And um, I think that's a really important takeaway because people feel anxious when they're overwhelmed. And what can really help is just to narrow that down and just to go, oh, Okay, rather than being worried about 12 things, I can be proportionally less worried, but still a bit worried about three things. That's gonna make you feel better. It's actually going to, ironically enough, help you make a decision. So I hope that helps, okay? Um, let me know if that makes sense. Um, let me know in the comments section, anxiety, bang, yes, whatever you need to do, okay? Newsletter questions, okay? We've got two really good ones here. We've got struggling to make decisions. How do I overcome this? And I've, so, hey, Tom, looking forward, I normally get stuck in the past. How do I overcome trauma? I understand that's my responsibility to take on, move towards the future. How do I overcome it in day one? Okay, so we'll start with the first one. Making decisions is a skill. Learning to make good decisions is a skill, okay? It requires practice. A lot of people, what happens to them when they, I see this a lot in clinical practice, when they really struggle to make decisions, and it's not just one specific thing, but it's something in general. What tends to happen is um, we look back on their childhood and it seems to be the case that they were never really given the option to cultivate it. Usually a parent was, was you know, a little bit dominating and um, made all the decisions for them or they were shut down for, you know, for thinking about who they wanted to be and what they wanted to do. Um, and that led to a stunting of their ability to practice making decisions. Because a lot of this stuff is learning, like learning to play the guitar. You know, people trying to, in their adult lives, make massive decisions for their kids and their families, you know, which is kind of like trying to learn how to play Stairway to Heaven and they haven't mastered a G chord because when it came time for everyone else to learn the G chord, they were seven years old, eight years old, okay? So the main thing there is that learning to make decisions effectively is a skill because you need to know more about how you think, how you make decisions. What decisions are the right ones based upon your values, your identity, your goals? So it's a skill and you need to, especially when you're an adult and you feel a sense of shame because you feel like you should have all this under control by now, 
Be kind to yourself and allow yourself to start at day one. Okay. And that can literally mean, I said this to a client two weeks ago, because I remember it really well. Fish and chips or pizza for the Friday night. Okay. If that's your edge, go for it. Okay. If that's too easy, make it harder. You choose where to go for the next date night with your spouse. Okay. If it's too hard, bring it down, find where your edge is and build from there. Last question here, getting stuck in the past. Hey Tom, I'm sure. Okay. All right. All right. So the thing about, the, I mean, this is a whole body of research. You know, I've done a lot of podcasts on trauma because I think it's a very important topic. Um, what I think is really important when it comes to trauma is that there's two sides to it. So especially when it's overcoming. So it's understanding what the trauma is for you and how it actually negatively impacts your life. So this is the self-awareness aspect of overcoming trauma. So much of that is understanding what your patterns are, you know, where you feel triggered or where you notice an affect response. Okay. This is the area of self-awareness. This is where talk therapy is brilliant. Meditation, people engage in psychedelics and plant medicine, time alone, solitude, diary writing, really open, honest conversations with friends, cold showers, because then you find out what you're capable of and who you are, or your belief systems, bit of an NLP thing there. So that's one side of it. That's the self-awareness thing. Because if I go, oh, wow, whenever I'm around dogs, I, I, I notice a panic and you work back from that and you go, well, why would that be the case? And then bang, seven years old, that's right. That, um, that dog bit me, whatever it is. And then you go, oh, and ever since then, I've always tended to walk on the other side of the pavement on the road because that big dog's on that side. So your, your mind starts to join the patterns because it starts to see it. You know, you're taking yourself outside of the jar so you can read the label. The next step is integration. And you don't need to be a therapist to understand what integration is. It's literally just doing the opposite of, of what the trauma wants, to, wants you to do because you're going to be locked in that so long as you continue to abide and adhere to its rules of behavior. Okay. It's hard. And I want you to know that it's hard. Okay. And hopefully that will, you know, remove a lot of the shame so that you can allow yourself to be a humble learner and try again. You know, if you were assaulted for, um, you know, thinking for yourself and now you're 48 years old and you struggle to make decisions, you can imagine how, learning or trying to make a decision is going to trigger that sense of I'm not safe if I do this because your body remembers that it was assaulted once for doing so. So you take it right back and you go, okay, what's my edge? What's the first thing that I can do to build towards overcoming this trauma? And there is immense fulfillment and purpose just to bring this back full circle um, in this, you know, day one, this is the stuff. And you start to see your path and you alchemize pain into purpose and you become someone that you didn't know you thought you could be and you begin to help other people on day one. And that's just a, a, a wonderful, um, you know, journey in, 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 in life and, and something that a lot of people believe is the journey, is the conscious journey in life. So that would be my um, take on, on those two questions. But um, guys, short one. Um, Zag, if you're still around, mate, do you have any questions at the moment? Um, totally expect um, people to chime in and, and jump in when they're watching the replay. That's totally cool. Also, Rome wasn't built in a day, so I'm looking forward to continuing to do these. Um, and it's always fun when you do it for, for week one. But, um, yeah, we'll see how we go. But, Zag, if you don't have any questions, mate, um, then um, what I might do is leave it for there. If you do have any questions, guys, and you are watching the replay, just write it in the comment section because I'll check this group pretty regularly because I've, I've um, I want to I want to build it and make it something quite fun, and um, and I'll and I'll be able to to answer it. Now what what I might even do is actually answer it in next week's um, weekly training because um, that may, might be quite um, might might be an effective way for me to do it too. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for your time and um, yeah, be, speak to you soon.